Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Defense Systems Information Analysis Center, or DSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. ESIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the defense systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the defense systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the Defense Systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DOD defense systems research. All right, well, thank you everybody for joining. Hopefully you're able to catch that little introduction video commercial for DSI Act to understand who we are and what we do. Uh, my name is Brian Benish, uh, the technical lead with uh, DSI Defense Systems Information Analysis Center. We're happy to have Aaron here with us for this presentation. Um, just a couple words of introduction before I hand the, the mic over to Aaron. Um, about the, those in the WebEx platform, uh, I want to point out one important feature, which is the Q&A section. At any point during the presentation, if you have a question that you would like to ask Aaron, please enter that into the Q&A section and we will Get to those at the end um, in the order they were received. So if you do not if you do not see the Q and A uh, portion of the the WebEx platform, you might want to try to find some three ellipses, some little ellipses, and uh, click those. Find uh, click on Q and A, and you can get your question in that way. Um, make sure that is uh, identify that as being different than the the chat section. I would definitely encourage you to put a question in the Q and A uh, and not the chat. Uh, let's see, if you run into any technical difficulties during the presentation, rest assured this is being recorded and we'll make this available. Um, additionally, we will be uh, uploading the slides to the webinar webpage on dsiac.org, so you can download them. Um, they, they'll be available shortly for download. Um, and just a reiteration of what was mentioned in the, uh, the little introductory video, as an information analysis center, uh, DSI is one of the chief services we offer is technical inquiry research. Uh, so if you have any technical question uh, that we can help you with, maybe in the area here of nonlethal weapons or any other topic on the defense systems domain, we are happy to help you. We are fully funded to perform uh, about four hours or so of research to help you get a head start to any topic, any question you might have in, 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 a, in a short amount of time. So head to our website, check out how you can uh, send a question our way, how we can help. Um, and, and Aaron is one of those subject matter experts in our community that we reach out to for um, support and answering questions, getting information on the topics here in particular, non lethal weapons. So I'm again happy to have Aaron here for this presentation. Uh, quick introduction on Aaron Hodges. He is currently the uh, acquisition program support officer supporting the US Air Force's non lethal weapon program. Um, he has served 20 years in the Air Force as a security forces specialist and later as a combat arms instructor, where he received advanced instruction on air based ground defense, law enforcement and security operations, and the training, delivery, operational employment, and field maintenance of small arms and light weapons. He was later assigned to the Air Force Security Forces Center, where he served as the program manager for the Air Force small arms and light weapon requirements. Prior to his military retirement, he transitioned to the manager. Uh, to manager of the military working dog scheduling office where he and his staff were responsible for tasking military working dog teams across the DOD to support U.S. Secret Service and Department of State dignitary protection missions across the globe. Aaron holds a BA in psychology from American Military University with a concentration in abnormal deviant and violent behavior as well as a MS in human resources development from Villanova University. 
And so, Aaron, again, thanks for joining us. Thanks for delivering the presentation. And I will uh, mute myself and hand the mic over to you. Take it away. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, before we start, I do want to state one thing uh, with regards to this dem or with regards to this presentation. Uh, although I am a contractor for the Department of Defense and specifically uh, the Joint Intermediate Force Capabilities Office and the Air Force Non-Lethal Weapons Program, uh, this presentation represents my own work. Uh, it does not represent the official position of the United States Air Force or the GIFCO. Um, so everything that we discuss, this is based off of information that I've been able to, to pull from open sources, as well as uh, uh, academic discussions that I've been part of over the, the past several years. So with that being said, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll start. Uh, I do wanna thank everybody for attending. I understand that for a lot of us, it's uh, the lunch hour. So I appreciate you taking your time uh, to be with me and uh, we'll go ahead and we'll we'll move forward. So. Uh, we're going to break this into two discussion points. Uh, the first part is going to be essentially the Air Force Non-Lethal Weapons Program. Uh, that's to serve as a primer and the foundational uh, presentation essentially for uh, everybody who's attending this briefing. And then we'll go ahead and we'll move into the de-escalation uh, of geopolitical tensions uh, with respect to non-lethal weapons and how they can be uh, theoretically employed uh, in those competition zones that that we continue to hear so much about so uh i do want to note that these presentations uh were done uh the were or pardon me were prepared the last week of october and the first week of november um although there's been several months between the presentation development and today um, it's key to note that when we talk about these capabilities, uh, particularly when we get into the second part of this uh, presentation, uh, we're not seeing a de-escalation of, of tensions across the geopolitical spectrum. Uh, what we're seeing actually is a ramp up of those geopolitical tensions, particularly in some of the hotspots that we'll be addressing. Uh, without getting too far into the weeds, because I don't want to steal any thunder later in the, the presentation, uh, we will be discussing the Russian-Ukraine uh, war, as well as uh, tensions in the Middle East, particularly with regards to commercial shipping and uh, Iranian actions in the, the um, Persian Gulf. So we will discuss a little bit about that, as well as some of the additional, uh, the additional uh, events that have occurred since the development of these briefings back in the, the fall of last year. So moving into the Air Force Non-Lethal Weapons Program, uh, we're gonna discuss uh, what a non-lethal weapon is with respect to how the Air Force defines this. Uh, we'll discuss also some non-lethal weapons program milestones. Those will not be just for the Air Force, but for the program at large within the DOD and the Joint Non-Lethal Weapons, uh, non weapons Program. I will talk a little bit about the inner or the transition to intermediate force capabilities and then the future of non-lethal weapon options within the Air Force, uh, focusing on uh, not just kinetic energy, but directed energy as well. Uh, with respect to the second part of this presentation, when we move into de-escalation of the geopolitical tensions throughout competition continuum, we're gonna talk about geopolitical competition. Uh, that is the new normal that, that we expect to, to operate within the Air Force and within the government. Um, and that's backed up by a lot, of the, a lot of the policy that we're starting to see being developed, whether it's the national security strategy, as well as some of the talking points that you're starting to see reported in, in the, the media. Uh, from geopolitical competition, we'll talk about DOD specific information. That'll go into the integrated campaigning concept, um, how non-lethal weapons and intermediate force capabilities can be utilized in competition planning, uh, the desired outcome of those systems or those capabilities, and then we'll discuss briefly some of the competition hotspots in which non-lethal weapons or intermediate force capabilities uh, could be used to ensure that, that the actions that are occurring today do not result in full-scale wars. Uh, from there, we will go ahead and we'll finish the presentation with question and answers. Uh, the Q&A session, we're actually going to combine the Q&A for, for both. So that will occur, uh, questions and answers for each one of the, the um, presentations will occur at the end of the de-escalating geopolitical tension uh, presentation. 
So with respect to the Air Force non-lethal weapons program, I think it's very key because we start running into uh, very key to to discuss this because we start running into some questions as to what are non-lethal weapons, what aren't non-lethal weapons, and how does the concept of intermediate force capability bridge the gap uh, when non-lethal weapons are involved? So the Air Force takes a very uh, book a book related answer uh, to this or position. Uh, we look at non-lethal weapons as devices that have immediate and relatively reversible effects on personnel or materiel. They are designed to incapacitate, incapacitate personnel or materiel, and they minimize fatalities and permanent injury to personnel. Uh, the reason we want to look at non-lethal weapons in this perspective is because as we start to transition out and the scope starts to broaden, um, it starts to envelop some other capabilities that the DOD has, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but to ensure that our to ensure that our program scope remains focused on what the Air Force needs, we focus on the traditional concept of non-lethal weapons. Um, that creates goodness for us, but it can create some consternation within the community. And I say that because as we move we move out into intermediate force capabilities and we start to bring expanded stakeholders in, uh, we rely on individuals and programs that we have no no uh, understanding of or we have no background in to feed us information to inform our policies uh, if we don't understand it i guess the big thing is the takeaway is, is nothing really gets acted upon uh, because we don't know where to start and we don't know where to end so as we transition we look at dod uh, directive 3000.03 echo uh, that is our essentially bread and butter when it comes to defining what those non-lethal weapons that the Air Force is interested in. Uh, and this th directive identifies 10 areas where non-lethal weapons have the potential to enhance a commander's ability. They distilled down into four, essentially four key areas. It's to deter hostile actions and activity, to deny movement, to de-escalate or escalate force as appropriate, and to protect our personnel. So what is not a non-lethal weapon? And this is this is important because again, as we start to look at intermediate force capabilities, you start to see IFCs expand beyond that traditional non-lethal weapon realm. So again, we look at the DOD instruction, we look at what the existing policy is today, and based off of, of, of those policies, we can define what is not a non-lethal weapon because it's very specific in the DOD instructions. Uh, information operations, cyber operations, or other military capabilities that are not explicitly designed and primarily employed to incapacitate personnel or material immediately, and that's the key word, it's immediately while minimizing fatalities, permanent injury, and undesirable property damage. So when you look at, when you look at other areas within the DOD and, and how they align with non-lethal weapons, if there is not an immediate incapacitation effect, then it doesn't necessarily fall in the non-lethal weapons realm. However, that doesn't mean that it doesn't fall within the intermediate force capability realm, right? So when we start talking non-lethal weapons and IFCs, it's very important that we start to, that we delineate that path and understand that non-lethal weapons are one capability and a larger subset when it, when it comes to IFCs. Also, what is not a non-lethal weapon? There are specific electronic warfare capabilities that involve electro-optical, infrared, and radio frequency countermeasures, electromagnetic capabilities and deception, electromagnetic hardening, interference intrusion, and jamming, as well as electronic masking, probing, reconnaissance, intelligence. So with respect to, with respect to those, again, those devices, are those capabilities may be identified as intermediate force capabilities, but for our intents and purposes within the Air Force, we don't identify them as non-lethal weapons. All right. So some of the program milestones within the Department of Defense uh, Joint Non-Lethal Weapons Program, as well as the Air Force Non-Lethal Weapons Program, uh, started back in 1996, uh, which it at which time the United States Marine Corps was appointed as the executive agent for non-lethal weapons. Uh, there was a memorandum of understanding signed by the services in 2011 that dealt specifically with the joint non-lethal weapons program. 
In 2015, we saw the publishing of the Joint Non-Lethal Weapons Program Science and Technology Strategic Plan. That's important because we're in that timeline right now, uh, the 2016 to 2025. So that document provides us some guidance and st some strategic direction on what it is that we need to what it is that we need to accomplish within our specific service program. In 2018, there was an update uh, to DOD Directive 3000.03 ECHO, which is the DOD Executive Agent for Non-Lethal Weapons and Non-Lethal Weapons Policy, as well as the DOD Instruction 3200.19, which is Non-Lethal Weapons Human Effects Characterization. In 2019, the Joint Non-Lethal Weapons Directorate became the Joint Inter Intermediate Force Capabilities Office. And in the same year, Air Force Doctrine Publication 3-10, force protection was updated. Uh, this Air Force Doctrine Publication is very important for our career field as a whole, the Security Forces career field, uh, because it essentially defines how the Air Force fights on the ground and in the air when it comes to force protection and what our, what our force planners, what our war planners need to consider when developing their war plans. So, so with respect to this document, this really kind of identifies or provides a foundational, uh, foundational uh, policy for the Air Force on how non-lethal weapons can be employed within our various, uh, our various military uh, requirements, whether they be force protection from a contingency standpoint or military operations other than a war, whether they be humanitarian up to uh, civil assistance and, and beyond. So as we transition to the concept of intermediate force capabilities, um, we need to keep in mind that this is a non-doctrinal term right now that is adopted to reflect the potential for increased capabilities beyond traditional non-lethal weapons. All right, the GIFCO has been very, uh, been very instrumental in trying to get intermediate force capabilities identified within those DOD policies, which, which touch the non-lethal weapons world. Um, they are in the process of trying to transition IFC or intermediate force capabilities into uh, a doctrinal term. And based off of the success that they've been having, uh, what I would say is that means the Air Force probably will need to transition as well. Um, with that being said, there's, of course, the opportunity for things to expand. The program could expand outside of the realm of the non-lethal weapons world. However, until those major decision points get codified in DOD, which then drives the Air Force to codify them as well, we still can't foot stomp enough, look at non-lethal weapons in the traditional sense. So with the transition of intermediate force capabilities or the transition to those IFCs, uh, what that does is it expands efforts to a larger group of stakeholders as we previously touched. It aligns those non-lethal weapons primarily, or non-lethal weapons are primarily aligned to law enforcement and physical security functions within the DOD, but it allows larger communities within the DOD and within the services to adopt non-lethal weapons or intermediate force capabilities uh, to meet their mission's needs. It also represents paradigm, a shift in functional paradigms, and it aligns the non-lethal weapons capabilities to uh, capabilities such as military information support operations, electronic warfare or electromagnetic spectrum management, and then traditional modalities of lethality. So when we look at non-lethal weapons, we look at lethal weapons, whether it be an aircraft, a uh, ground weapon like an M4 carbine, or some of the other systems that we may have. Um, traditionally, when we, when we look at the Department of Defense, lethality is the mission, right? That's what we do. We execute force on an objective, and we do it very well when you look at it. We fight traditional wars, but non-lethal weapons allow us to not just supplement, but to enable lethality. So they go hand in hand, which right now, uh, what I would say the paradigm that we start to see is that they're truly separated, right? And that's within the DOD, not just within the Air Force. And because non-lethal weapons are considered non-lethal, it seems to be counterintuitive to some of our decision makers when their traditional focus is on the lethality of the force, not 
the force's ability to execute IFCs or non-lethal weapons as a whole. So with respect to intermediate force capabilities, this is a, a good chart, I believe, to discuss or to kind of highlight what the importance is. Uh, within the DOD, we apply force, we put we put people in, in hostile places. When we provide them intermediate force capabilities or non-lethal weapons, we provide the commander two options. And we provide the civilian population as well as the force that we're, we're fighting against two options. We can either de-escalate the situation, which is the picture that is presented in the bottom right-hand corner, um, and allow everything to go on as normal, or intermediate force capabilities, non-lethal force or non-lethal weapons allow commanders, when appropriate, to escalate as necessary, and then we start running into those uh, the hostile actions as well as the the violent the violent acts of force that the DoD is is traditionally aligned with. So understanding kind of everything that we've discussed so far, and I know it's kind of been a, a whirlwind of, of information, uh, what is the future of non-lethal weapons with respect to the Air Force? Uh, one, thing that, one thing that we need to do a better job of is we need to leverage the existing doc doctrinal documents and relationships to understand how those, how those relationships, doctrinal documents, and, and capabilities that are being to being developed will influence our program into the future. With respect to the Air Force future operating concept, in 2015, uh, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force released a future operating concept that called for the modernized, a modernized diverse range of munitions, emitters, and delivery systems capable of delivering scalable lethal and non-lethal options that span the range from exquisitely precise strikes to mass effects to include nuclear capabilities. Now recently, the Air Force future operating concept was updated. Uh, a new executive summary was released in March of 2023. Uh, it represents a shift in focus on how we were we were leveraging force and executing that force in the battlefields of yesterday, uh, and it's aligning with the expectation of how we execute force and engage in battle in the battlefields of tomorrow. Uh, we have not seen the new future operating concept, but that is one document that we will have to align with our processes to ensure that non-lethal weapons and intermediate force capabilities continue to be fielded and given to the warfighter at large. Additional things that we can do is we can foster relationships with our research laboratories as well as within the DOD uh, science and technology communities to identify suitable solutions regardless of the energetic characteristics. All right, we look at kinetic energy, which is which is the majority of the systems that we currently have. Uh, and then we look at directed energy as well. We need to partner with expanded stakeholders to identify requirements, test our solutions, and generate desired outcomes. We also need to consider how we can leverage what the Congressional Research Service identified as a over $1 billion investment in DOD development of unclassified directed energy research test, evaluation, and weapon system procurement. We leave a lot of money on the table as a, as a service. And one, one thing that our program needs to do is we need to find a way in which we can forge those relationships, identify those expanded stakeholders, and leverage that investment, whether it be Air Force investment or sister service investment, to get non-lethal weapons and intermediate force capabilities into the hands of the airmen and the guardians. And then we also need to continue to field, sustain, and upgrade our legacy systems to meet the needs of our expanded stakeholders, whether they're security forces or some of our uh, Air Force spec war individuals. And those legacy systems include conducted energy weapons, such as the taser devices, as well as other human electromuscular incapacitation devices that may be uh, currently under development. Uh, flashbang grenades, acoustic hailing devices, laser dazzlers or ocular interrupters, as well as compressed air launchers. So now that everybody uh, in attendance has 
kind of an understanding of where we are at with regards to non-lethal weapons, intermediate force capabilities, and how the Air Force envisions them. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll talk a little bit about de-escalation of geopolitical tensions and how these weapons can be used to enable uh, foreign policy on behalf of the U.S. government, partner nationships, our partner nations, and our allies. We're going to talk a little bit about geopolitical competition. We'll talk about integrated campaigning. Uh, we'll discuss non-lethal weapons and IFCs and competition planning, the desired outcomes, and then we'll briefly discuss competition hotspots, and then we'll end with a question and answer session. So when it comes to geopolitical competition being the new normal, we started to see, uh, we started to really see in the documentation being released by the government, uh, a trend around 2015 when it came to uh, that geopolitical com competition concept. Uh, you started to see information being released, uh, like the top, the top quote came from General Paul J. Selva, who was the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff stating that rather than attempting to impose a false dichotomy of peace or war or to assume an artificially static environment that can be broken into discrete campaigns with fixed end states, the joint competition, our joint concept for integrated campaigning recognizes the needs for proactive ongoing campaigning that adjusts to fluid policy environments and changing conditions to create favorable and sustainable outcomes. The takeaway from this is essentially that we need to understand that the role of the Department of Defense is changing. It's not just executing force on an objective. It's not just full-scale war. It's working with partner nations, working with allies, and working within our, within our own framework to utilize our capabilities, whatever they may be, to further the, the needs of the nations the cause of the nation and our mindset in which the world should operate. As we go further down into the history of this geopolitical competition, we start to see that policy guidelines and, and positions have changed, right? And they've changed for the better. So Colonel Wendell Leinbach, who is the director of the Joint Intermediate Force Capabilities Office was quoted as saying, as we look at the competition paradigm, we find ourselves today, we are facing adversaries that are competing in ways that are below the level of armed conflict. Intermediate force capabilities are uniquely capable of helping the warfighter compete across the entire continuum, and especially in that area below the level of armed conflict, where traditionally the United States military does not invest in a lot of capabilities. Those words are aligned with what we see in the most recent national security strategy in which the developers stated, we have learned lessons from our failures as well as our successes. The idea is that we should compete with major autocratic powers to shape the international order enjoys broad support that is bipartisan at home and deepening abroad. So these three quotes, these three mindsets coming from different organizations and different levels our echelons of leadership within the United States government all point in one way or another to non-lethal weapons and intermediate force capabilities. So with respect to inter our integrated campaigning, integrated campaigning focuses on four steps and it's a continuing cycle. It incorporates civil and military dialogue and that includes within the Department of Defense, the United States government, partner nations, and non-governmental organizations. It creates strategic advantage through the leverage of tailored military and non-military actions. It execute, executes missions based on primary stakeholder needs, and it assesses outcomes, consequences, and next steps. With respect to non-lethal weapons and intermediate force capabilities in the competition planning, you really start to see everything funnel down. First, we want to make sure that we are defining the operating environment. We want to understand as warfighters, as execution, the execution arm of force for the United States government, we want to understand if the environment is cooperative, competitive, or combative, because that's going to drive what capabilities are provided to the commanders on, on the ground to execute their missions. 
campaign planners also need to identify the capability needs to support the strategic outcomes of the DOD, the United States government, our coalition partners, and non-governmental agencies. Once we have identified the environment and what the strategic outcomes are, we can then design force packages that de are deployed that include non-lethal weapons and IFCs where appropriate. From the tactical forces conducting the missions, IFCs can be used to bolster the narrative of proportionality and cooperation. And one thing that commanders at all, no all levels need to consider is that the presence of non-lethal weapons and IFCs in their area of operation does not prohibit them from using lethal force when necessary. IFCs and non-lethal weapons are not considered a stepping stone to lethal force. They're, they should be considered as a force capability or a force package in and of itself. The DOD policy does not derive or does not drive the need for an individual to show, shout, shoot. If they're presented with deadly force, the individual has the ability to utilize deadly force. Once those tactical forces conducting those missions report back the information then goes back up to the campaign planners who will develop their further actions that are based on adversary activities and responses. The desired outcomes that are enabled by non-lethal weapons as well as intermediate force capabilities reside both in the tactical and the strategic arena. From the tactical perspective, non-lethal weapons enable the minimization or minimize risk of significant injury to civilian population. They demonstrate legal tenets of military operations to include military necessity, humanity, distinction, and proportionality. From a strategic level, they establish and maintain a rule-based international order. They strengthen partnerships and alliances. They reestablish local norms and quality of life, and they preempt competing or false narratives. From the joint combat operations, joint operating concept lines of effort, there were identified five cross-functional outcomes that non-lethal weapons can enable, and that's to shape the competition domain, deter belligerent behavior, seize competitive initiatives, stabilize countries, regions, and continents, and enable civilian authority. So let's talk a little bit about our competition hotspots in which we, we could see non-lethal weapons and intermediate force capabilities being utilized. We looked at three, or I looked at three different uh, areas. I looked at the Middle East with respect to the Iranian harassment and interdiction operations. I looked at the Black Sea with respect to Ukrainian and Russian war. And I looked at Southeast Asia and the South China Sea. These are three areas in which the Department of Defense continues to operate um, in certain respects or within regions or areas that are closely aligned with the operations, right? Um, I state that because with respect to the Black Sea, with uh, Ukraine and Russian war, I don't want to give the impression in any way that the United States is, is uh, involved in any of the uh, actual ground combat that's being, being uh, perpetrated within the Ukraine. So for operational relevance with the, within the Middle East, what we see is there have been multiple Iranian naval force attempts to capture United States Navy unmanned surface vessels. Uh, we've seen numerous instances in which the Iranian Republican Guard Corps has been harassing United States Navy or partner nation vessels at, uh, conducting maritime security operations. And we've seen the attempted or completed seizure of uh, civilian vessels by the Iranian Republican Guard Corps, uh, which has created problems not just for the host nations, but has disrupted commercial
Uh, one thing to consider with regards to non-lethal weapons or intermediate force capabilities, uh, back in the fall, uh, the Ukraine and Russia had, had brokered an agreement with the assistance of the UN uh, that allowed for 10 million, 10 million tons of food within the first three months of the conflict to be exported out of the Ukraine via the Black Sea. What we saw within the past couple of weeks is we've seen that that, that agreement has fallen apart. Russia has stated that they no longer want to participate in the agreement, which has allowed um, questions to, to come into play on, on how the Ukraine will allow or will be allowed to rely on their existing economic capabilities to sustain their country. Right. Within the Black Sea, there's three million or three trillion dollars in combined nominal GDP. That includes the Ukraine. There's 300 million people. There's 48,000 ships that pass through the Bosphorus Straits annually. 70% of the Ukrainian exports transition through the Black Sea. That was pre-war. Five million tons of food transitions per month pre-war. And with regards to Ukraine and the economic scale associated with that agreement, um, that agreement enabled 70% of the exports to transition out of the Ukraine. Based off of the road structure and the rail structures that they have, the infrastructure within Ukraine, only 10% of exports are exported by land means. If Ukraine has to transition to a land-based transport, they're going to be forced to transition through countries such as Poland, Lithuania, or Romania to have their, or to have their products moved out of their country, away from the Black Sea, and into the Baltic Sea. All of this costs time and money. All of this, with respect to geopolitical tensions, creates heightened areas in which people can make bad decisions, and it creates problems in which, from the respective area of the, from economic standpoints, excuse me, in which any instance that is out of question, any instance in which um, there's a shadow of a doubt of whether or not it is a friendly action or a violent action can cause this area to, to basically expand into larger armed conflicts. The last area I wanted to look at and wanted to discuss just briefly is the South China Sea. The South China Sea gets a lot of attention, particularly with regards to uh, China and their nine dash line. But we don't understand sometimes the importance of what that area uh, means to the world economies. So I found and was able to find a quote from Walter Russell Me uh, Mead in the Wall Street Journal that I think hammered home the point of how important this area is to the world. When we look at this quote, and we look at the actions that are being perpetrated within the South China Sea, we've seen that in recent months, Beijing has sunk Vietnamese fishing vessels, sent armed flotillas to harass Malaysian offshore energy exploration, and wielded maritime militia to surround Philippine outposts. That occurs to this, to this time as well. Beijing has further militarized its artificial islands in the Spratly, with new aircraft deployments, it's announced unilateral fishing bans, and it has conducted destabilizing military exercises in contested waters around disputed features. From an economic standpoint, if this area were to, to become a, a hot zone in which a, a shooting war, for lack of better terms, were to, were to occur, this would disrupt $3.4 trillion worth of shipborne commerce that transits the sea annually, it disrupts energy production. That region specifically contains about 11 billion dollars or 11 billion barrels of oil uh, that's proved to be probable reserves. This is the equivalent of the amount of proved oil reserves in Mexico. It also contains 190 trillion cubic feet of nat natural gas and significant stocks of fish, coral, and other undersea resources that are utilized by other countries for their economic purposes. 
finally in 2016, when we look at the South China Sea, we think of China and, and it being an issue just with the, the Asian countries or the Asian region. But when we look at the top 10 exporters in the South China Sea, we actually see that this area is used not just by Asian countries, but by European countries as well. And of the top 10, three of the countries that we consider friends and allies are involved. Japan represents a $141 billion, uh, $141 billion worth of exported goods. Germany represents $117 billion of exported goods, or about 3% of the South China Sea exports. And South Korea represents $249 billion, just behind China, as seven, with 7% 7 of the South China Sea exports. So when you consider the amount of, of commercial traffic and economic ties related to this region, in the event that there were some kind of a war that were to break out, um, it could be catastrophic across the across the globe. Non-lethal weapons in this respect allow us to gauge individual countries' uh, actions. It allows us to de-escalate where appropriate. It allows us to try to deter any of those actions in which a violent confrontation could be expected. So understanding all of this, understanding where we've been and kind of how the world presents this non-lethal weapons uh, or presents conundrums that that lend themselves to non-lethal weapons. I'd like to go ahead and open up for question and answers at this time. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, I appreciate the presentation. Well delivered, uh, great content. We did have a few questions come through already. So before I start reading them, we'll spend a, just a, a moment to remind everyone of the Q&A portal. So if, separate from the chat, if you maybe click the ellipses, uh, find Q&A, you, you can enter your question and put it in queue there. But we've got a handful that are already in, in queue that we're going to go ahead and uh, I'll just read them out to you, Aaron. Um, hopefully you have access. You can maybe read them as well. Um, and you can just respond to them and we'll, again, take them in order that they were received. So uh, uh, yeah. the first one came... First one that came in is just asking where the best places are to find effectiveness or risk information of the current non-lethal weapons. So things like percent of effectiveness, range, area, or significant risk of injury, et cetera. So with respect to with respect to, to that, uh, those that information should be captured in the requirements documents associated with the capability. Uh, if a requirements document was was captured or if, if it was written, uh, some services rely heavily on the JSITS process and, and developing those requirements, those needs within their inner or within their ICDs or their initial capability documents, the capability development documents, and then the capability production documents as well. Um, there are other methods in which uh, we can identify the effectiveness and effectiveness and risk information. Uh, the Joint Intermediate Force Capabilities Office, they do have a human effects section that can, can look at that. Uh, we will also rely on third party information, uh, whether it be uh, like human effects representation or human effects reporting out of John Hopkins University. Uh, the Air Force Research Laboratory has done some work for us. Um, a lot of that really is, is close hold. Um, so it depends on on who's asking for the information and whether or not it can be released to them. Um, so yeah, no, I, I don't have a, I don't have a solid answer for that because it exists, but a lot of right. it exists honestly based off of who you are and who you work for. Yep. Fair enough. Yeah. Thanks. And and again, I'll reiterate that as an organization entity here, DSI, we can we can help facilitate. Um, Getting you, you know, maybe help with Aaron's help as well. Getting getting you to the right person for the type of information you're looking for based on who you are. Um, all right. Next question came in asks if Jifco is Jifco part of the U.S. DoD efforts in the document civil harm mitigation and response from January of 2022. So that I can't I can't say. Okay. Uh, I don't. I I understand. I work for the GIFCO in some respects, but my primary focus is the, the United States Air Force and their non-lethal weapons program. 
Mm -hmm. uh, you would need to speak to the GIFCO specifically about that. I will say it has been brought up in several discussions that we've had. So I would, I'm assuming that they are part of it in some form or fashion, even if it's just uh, providing information when an RFI were to come out. But the depth of, of their, um, the depth of their involvement, I can't speak to. I'm sorry. Yep. No, fair enough. And I'm, I'm glad you recognize the ability to just say, you know, pass on some of these questions. So that, that's perfectly fine given the setting we're in. All right. Uh, the next question, though, uh, is asking, and I'm, I'm just going to kind of interpret it, but if there's maybe a contact, I suspect with, with GIFCO uh, that would be willing to, or that would like to know about information of commercial off the self shelf systems. So, okay. so what I what I would say is this: um, I can provide, I can provide the the uh, individual who posed the question with my contact information, um, okay. and what I will do is I will link them up with the appropriate, the appropriate office at Jifco. Um, okay. I I. I don't want to be a, a middleman if I don't need to be, but I think uh, when we come down to it, I want to make sure it gets to, to the right people and I don't want to give you bad information. So what I will say is if you reach out to me, um, you can reach out to me at Aaron. It's A-A-R-O-N dot Hodges, H-O-D like Delta, G-E-S dot one dot C-T-R at us.af.mil if you reach out to that email address i will uh, i will forward your inquiry to the gifco and and see what they can do to assist you all right very good thanks uh next question is asking about the dollar amount you uh, cited 1.014 billion in dod or is it uh for de related research um asking is that is that is that the dollar amount for DOD unclassified DE research per year? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure which slide that's in reference to exactly. So that is, I'm going to go back to that slide. So that slide was in, the, was in the Air Force, uh, the Air Force program slide. So yes, and that 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 information is not just research; it's development, it's research and development, test evaluation, and weapon system procurement. So it represents across the portfolio one. It's a little over one billion dollars annually, yeah. and that information was pulled out of the Directed Energy Primer for uh, from the Congressional Research Service, and that was based off of them looking at uh, the the presidential budget and identifying Directed Energy programs. So, so it was basically a, an aggregation of information that they had available to them. So, and I believe, if I remember correctly, it's been a while since I've looked at the primer. They stated that there may be errors with the number, but that's that's the number they came up with with the information they had. Got it. Okay. And I believe you have a a reference section in the back of the these slides as well, so that might be in there. Uh, let me take a look. I believe. Yep, I do. So yeah. that Congressional Research Service report, that is actually item number two here, um, as well as with the, the link, so you can uh, hyperlink to it. Perfect. Okay, good. All right. Um, the next question was asking, says, uh, regarding the spectrum of nonlethal weapons, do psychological operations fit under that umbrella? So I would, I would say from my perspective, no. But there's a caveat there. They would fall in the intermediate force capabilities umbrella. And as we tra and as we transition into that intermediate force capabilities concept, I think that that's where the ex expand more expanded stakeholders come into play, whether it be psyops, uh, whether it be electronic warfare or some of the other capabilities that are out there. Not that the GIFCO wants to own those, but they want to understand what it is that's being done. Uh, within those communities and how we can work collaboratively to assist each other uh, to field those capabilities. Gotcha. Good. Oh, good answer. Um, the next question asks if you could uh, maybe speak to some of the supportability issues that the Air Force is grappling with when it comes to non-lethal weapons. So thinking of things like uh, 
power requirements for integrating directed energy weapon systems into legacy platforms? So from our perspective, a lot of the a lot of the devices that we look at today actually are kinetic energy. Uh, they're based off of you know traditional traditional um, uh, explosives, basically. When you when you think about it, with flashbangs, it's uh, even with our uh, compressed air launchers, it's compressed air. It's it's not an electric uh, it's not an electric driven device essentially. Um, so I would say from a supportability issue from a swap C, we are aware of it, but we're not running into problems with it because the way in which our current devices operate. Um, as we move into future devices, I know that that's particularly from the directed energy perspective, that's going to be a huge problem. Um, what we tend to, to, to look for when we start to talk of uh, those capabilities is we want to be able to utilize uh, shore power because that's what we have available um, in areas where we may not have a, a, the ability to do shore power. We definitely want to make sure that we have the ability to link it to a, a generator, a tactical generator if necessary. Uh, smaller is better. Uh, when we look at some of the devices, some of the devices are very capable. Um, a good example is active denial system. I've I've experienced the active denial system. It is very capable. It does exactly what it is intended to do. Uh, the problem is, is it's extraordinarily too large for what it is that we need. Uh, we can't roll, we can't roll a large tactical equivalent of an 18 wheeler onto an aircraft, uh, along with all, all of our other equipment that we, we may need to set up a forward operating location. Uh, it's just not possible. So, you know, smaller is better. Um, when it comes to our existing systems, it's, they're really based off of legacy energetics um, and directed energy, while it may be the future, uh, doesn't really come into play um, for various reasons right now. All right, very good. Um, I'm going to kind of jump around with some of the, based on some of the questions we got um, and also questions in the chat. So this one question uh, received in the chat, but and I'm going to paraphrase it, but it essentially is asking um, what consideration not the Chifco uh, has with respect to uh, non-lethal capabilities using drones, um, or uh, well, I'll say yeah, us using drones or countering them. So maybe drone use for non-lethal weapon systems. So there is a there is yes. I'll just simply state yes. There, there <laughs> are programs uh, that are being looked at. They, if I remember correctly, there are budget line items specifically for programs for for drone purposes, integrating IFCs into into drones. Uh, more from a tactical perspective, not necessarily integrating in uh, into drones at least at this time into you know a war fighting a war fighting airframe uh, one thing with respect to airframes we don't touch airframes uh, we we as an air force don't touch airframes from the non-lethal weapons program perspective that is managed by the a3 community our program resides in the a4 community um, it is specifically uh, the leadership starts at the air staff and it's uh it's the director of security forces. It's a one-star general, and it trickles down to the expanded stakeholders and in the security forces community. So, yes, I would say there is. Uh, that is a GIFCO program. It is not necessarily something that we are involved in, but like anything else, if we identify a need as a service for it, we we jump on board and and try to uh, try to provide information so we can get those capabilities out to our war fighters. Uh, both in the Air Force as well as within the joint communities. Okay, great. Well, and that, that might answer one of the other questions uh, that we received asking, um, maybe I might be misinterpreting it, but asks any, is there any specific project for non-lethal weapon airborne, which I'm taking to mean uh, non-lethal weapon systems on aircrafts or, you know, deployed off of an aircraft system? So, Again, I would state from the big perspective when we're talking 
large airframes like yeah, F-35s, F-22s, C-17s, that's not within our, that's not within our scope of responsibility. We're looking more at tactical ground-based uh, non-lethal weapons and IFCs within our community. Um, we're not seeing any requirement per se about that, but again, um, if the requirement gets developed, that's where we would step in and we would work with the GIFCO as well as the users to identify what's out there and, and how we can we can field those solutions um, for the warfighter. Got it. Okay. Right. Um, I think maybe our last question that I'll pose to you is asking um, if there says if there if a war breaks out there's conflicts in the South China Sea. Um, are U.S. defense companies diversifying the source of supply away from Asia in order to maintain production of critical technology that non-lethal weapon systems need? So maybe speaking towards the long-term um, yeah, sustainability of non-lethal weapon systems in the face of potential wars and conflict. So that's not anything that we've really looked at. Um, those may be discussions that are being done within certain within certain communities within the Air Force. I'm thinking like munitions communities, uh, PEO soldier within the Army, or I'm sorry, not PEO soldier, PEO uh, ammunition within the Army. But that's not that's not something really that the Air Force Non Lethal Weapons Program has looked at. We partner with those communities where it's appropriate as well, um, like with with regards to development of our flashbang capabilities or our, our munitions based capabilities. Uh, what I would say is this, because uh, I, I think that this this question actually poses to a, a or actually kind of points to a larger discussion point. Um, and it goes back to non lethal weapons and the, the inherent oxymoron, I guess you would say, with respect to the DOD and their their lethality based concepts. Um, non lethal weapons. <laughs> They don't compete in certain circles uh, and, and at certain uh, leadership echelons with the lethal capabilities because, you know, the, the true mission of the Air Force, the true mission within the Department of Defense is to execute wars. Um, and I say the true mission is that's what our primary mission is. We get involved with other mission sets. That is true. And I think as we make as we make the point, uh, particularly with these with this presentation, um, non-lethal weapons, intermediate force capabilities, they have a very viable uh, place when it comes to the future of DOD and governmental operations, particularly in that competition continuum or the competition spectrum. But uh, I will tell you, based off of what I've seen in my experience, uh, non-lethal weapons don't necessarily get the same amount of, I would say the same amount of respect that might be a little bit too strong. But they don't get the same amount of play <laughs> at, at certain levels that they do more at the tactical level. Yeah. Good. Well, that honestly, that that's a great way to to kind of end it. Um, and uh, I I do want to honor the time. We're right at the, the end of the hour here. So, Aaron, thanks so much for the presentation, for fielding all the questions, and did a great job responding to all of them. Thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, and again, these. This presentation will be uh, available. The video will be available soon. Slides are already on the website. So if you have any other questions, please reach out to us at DSIAC or get get in touch with Aaron at the email that he provided. So, again, thanks, Aaron. You're very welcome. I want to thank again everybody who who attended, and I w I want to express my appreciation to you and the DSIAC team for for allowing this to occur. Thank you. Absolutely, our pleasure. All right, everyone, have a great rest of your day.